Good afternoon. It's Wednesday. Time for Wednesday night Bible study. I'm Pastor Danny. We're at the Oaks Church in Gainesville, Florida. We are. We've been working our way through 1 Corinthians. So tonight we're in chapter 4 and we'll probably get into chapter 5. Now in the earlier part of this letter, Paul was really, he was criticizing um, the church members because some of them were saying, I am of Paul. Others were saying, no, I'm, I follow Apollos. Some were saying, no, Peter is the one I follow. And his point is that we follow Jesus. So I'm going to pick up in verse uh, 14, chapter 4, verse 14. I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. You know, if you have children, you know there are times that you just have to say, let me just tell you what, what to watch out for here. You need to really be careful about, especially running out in a street. You know, it could be very dangerous, those kinds of things. So Paul is, is, is explaining to them, look, I'm, my whole goal here is I view you as spiritual children in a sense. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. So uh, Paul's whole attitude was one as a, like a father. Uh, not some of the fathers we have today who abuse their children or who neglect their children or who abandon their children, but a, fa a loving father who cares for his children and is willing to invest time and energy to instruct them. Therefore, I urge you, imitate me. In other words, if you want to, if you want to know what it looks like to follow Jesus, just, just observe my life. That's what it's like. For this reason, I've sent Timothy to you who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. Okay. You know, we can agree on what the Bible says. Sometimes we don't agree on what it means. How do we interpret what the Bible says? And then sometimes we don't agree on how do you apply what the Bible says. Now, we can fully agree on what it says, but what does it mean? And what is the, what is the Lord saying to me? Well, uh, there's room for disagreement on those points in, in some situations. But now some of you are puffed up as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you shortly, if the Lord wills. And I will know, not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. Hmm. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. In other words, when God speaks, it, it actually does something. It doesn't just kind of sit there. It's not just words. Um, there's a kind of an old expression, words are cheap. Anybody can say anything. We've seen this proven over and over and over. Multitudes of times, this, well, practically this entire year, because of the election that's coming up, you know, next week. Um, people say all kinds of things. And a lot of them we know are not true. In fact, they, they know it's not true when they say it. Uh, they just want to get elected. So words can be cheap when we human beings are speaking. But when God speaks, it's not cheap. It's power. When God speaks, things happen. The kingdom of God is not in word, but it's in power. Verse 21, what do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod 
or in love and a spirit of gentleness. In other words, uh, do you want me to come ready to discipline you? Or do you want me to be gentle when I come? And then he jumps into uh, what we call chapter 5, uh, pretty heavy. So we're just going to jump right in there. One of the issues that was pretty serious in the church in Corinth, and as I've already said many times before, uh, Corinth was one of those places that was uh, full of all kinds of sexual immorality. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. Oh my goodness. Let's think about that for a second. There's sexual immorality among you. Not too many years ago, um, a church which I will not name, had, uh, they had an issue with some of the teenagers in the church, under age, they, they were not adults yet, but they were acting like adults. There was sexual activity going on among the teenagers. And when it was discovered, you can imagine uh, it developed into all kinds of problems. I don't, I don't know exactly what happened in the church. I just know that the end result is that church doesn't exist anymore. There's a whole different congregation in the facility. Completely different leadership, completely different name, completely different denominational associations. So sexual immorality is a very serious issue, and especially if it's happening in a local church. It's not even named among the Gentiles that a man has his father's wife. Okay, the, the, only, the only reasonable way I can look at this is that perhaps a man's wife died, he remarried, and there's a stepmom in the family, and there's uh, an adult male child. That's the only way I can figure it out. May have been something different. Nonetheless, it was a serious problem. It was more serious because the church leadership just kind of ignored it and kind of swept it under the rug, so to speak. You are puffed up, verse 2, and you have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed, as absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present the one who has so done this deed. Paul is giving a very clear teaching that immorality, if it's known, and apparently it was, should not be tolerated in the local church. Now, that being said, that doesn't mean that everybody is always perfect. I think what he's saying here is that if there's something happening that everybody in the whole community knows about, they also know that the perpetrators are active members of that local church fellowship in that kind of case, you have to do something. You have to do church discipline. It's difficult. I, I, I'll be the first to admit. I've been here at uh, the Oaks Church now for, what, every, we came in 97, so, I don't know, 26, 27 years. And over those, over those years, we've had two different situations where... It was obvious that there was stuff going on. Everybody in the community, 
knew about it. Well, maybe not everybody, but a lot of people. And there didn't seem to be any conviction about changing. In both cases, um, I got some of the church uh, leadership to go with me to confront the person, not to condemn. The goal was never condemnation. But the goal was, let's, let's see if we can't make a change and let's have some repentance. One of those situations turned out very good, very good. Um, I won't take time to tell all the stories, but uh, uh, let me just put it this way. That man repented. He came before the church and made a public apology, asked forgiveness. The church had already forgiven him. And the fellowship was restored. In the other situation... It was a person who was lying to the church in order to gain, I don't know, among other things, money. That one did not turn out all that well, I'm sorry to say. Nonetheless, Paul is making it very clear that there are some situations you can't just ignore. And so that's, this is definitely one of them. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse number four, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, here's what Paul is recommending. Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Ooh. That's pretty harsh, right? What is he actually saying here? Deliver this person over to Satan. So that the flesh will ultimately be destroyed. But the spirit of this person will be saved. All right, I think the first thing he's saying is this man who was doing this thing was a believer in Christ. He was a believer. Otherwise, he wouldn't have said so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. In other words, when Christ comes back, he, he will be, his spirit will be saved. So, What's this all about, delivering such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh? I don't know the actually saying, we're actually going to turn you over to the devil. <coughs> Sorry. I think what he's actually saying is, this man has already chosen that path. You as a local church, you will just recognize that. If you've prayed, if you've confronted him, if you've asked him to repent and he will not, really he's turned himself over to Satan in a way. Paul is basically saying, don't fellowship with him. He claims to be a believer. He, w he was active in the church. You, need to, you don't need to be fellowshipping with that person. Your glorying is not good. So, are there some sins that can't be forgiven? I mean, is this one that couldn't be forgiven? Uh, no, it's not. There is a sin that can't be forgiven. It's unbelief. 
I mean, if you just don't believe in Jesus, you can't be forgiven. But sexual sins can be forgiven. So, uh, but apparently they were just, the church was just going, floating right along, and everybody knew it, but they just pretended it wasn't happening. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Huh. In other words, if you just ignore this, don't you know that others very well may think, oh, well, we, we can live just like anybody else in town who's not a follower of Jesus. We can have all as much sexual sin activity as we want and still be active in the church. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you truly are unleavened. A leaven is a symbolic of sin. You've been forgiven, you've been cleansed. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Christ, our Passover. You remember what Passover is? Passover was the tenth plague that God put on the Egyptians. They were holding the uh, children of Israel as slaves. They'd been there in Egypt for 430 years. And that Pharaoh had, was putting so much pressure on them. And they were crying out for deliverance. So God sent Moses to deliver them. And the tenth plague was called Passover. On that night... Every one of the children of Israel, of every family, was to kill, cook a lamb, and catch some of the blood, smear it on the door facing of the house. That night, the death angel, the death angel passed over, passed over all of Egypt, and everywhere the blood of the lamb was, the death angel did not visit. Everywhere, every household that did not have the blood of the lamb on the door facing, the death angel visited and the firstborn died. Christ is that lamb. Christ Jesus is that lamb. Who, sacrifice, who was sacrificed so we could live. And it's not just the blood on the doorposts. It's the blood applied to the door of our heart. Christ is our Passover. And he was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. In other words, let us remember the Lord's Supper. Let's keep that feast. Not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Let's come together. Let's celebrate. Let's worship. But let's don't come openly in rebellion. Openly sinning. Let's not do that. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet, I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. 
But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother. Ah, there's the difference. Who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner. Not even to eat with such a person. In other words, you should disfellowship yourself from those who are openly defying the Lord and at the same time sitting at the Lord's table expecting to just live like the devil, live with the devil's crowd and then sit right at the Lord's table. All right, let's go back here in verse 10. I didn't mean that you shouldn't keep company with these kind of people of the world. Because otherwise, how will they ever hear the truth? So what Paul is actually saying here is, if someone who is an active member of the local church and also is openly rebellious towards God, whether it's sexual immorality or some other kind of uh, obvious agreement with the devil. Those are the ones you should not keep fellowship with, those who claim to be brothers in Christ. But you can be friends with those who are not yet believers because otherwise, how will they ever hear? How will they ever know? How will they ever see the Lord Jesus Christ alive in you? It won't happen. Well, let's see. He's talking about uh, don't keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral. Uh, immoral. We talked about that. Covetous. What is, what is covetousness? It's and you want what somebody else has. And you're willing to do almost anything to get it. I expect covetousness is responsible for some pretty serious, some pretty serious sins. I mean, for instance, if you uh, wanted somebody else's wife, and you're willing to do anything to make that happen, who knows what you might do. Or an idolater. In other words, you, you claim to worship Christ, but you also have your idols. I remember uh, not too many years ago, we had a Chinese family who was uh, attending our church young woman was working on a Ph.D. at the University of Florida. She had her little daughter here. And the daughter, I think, was about, what, maybe nine years old at the time? About nine. And she had brought her mom over here to take care of the granddaughter while she finished her dissertation. So... The young woman accepted Christ, her daughter accepted Christ, and then her mom accepted Christ. And they, they all were interested in becoming members of our church and being baptized and all of that. So I made an appointment to sit down with the family. And we have a little membership book that I, I like to just kind of work our way through. So I opened the membership book and we started on the first page. And um, the young woman said, Pastor, my mom, uh, she, she has a question. I said, okay. And she's having horrible nightmares. All right? What are the questions? So, and I closed the membership book, and we talked about that. And, um, well, we ended up taking authority over some 
evil things that have happened in that apartment before they moved in. And all of the horrible nightmares went away. But she said, we have some little statues of Buddha. I said, okay. How did you get them? I mean, did you just pick them up somewhere you thought, well, these look kind of nice? No. Some Buddhist priest brought them and placed them in our house. This is over in China. I said, ooh. The problem is, you know, they prayed over those things. They committed your house to the spirit of Buddha, which is not the Holy Spirit. And if it's not the Holy Spirit, it's a demon. So, with your husband's permission, you have to get rid of those when you go back home. Ooh. Could I give them away? Well, no. You'd be giving somebody else the problem. No, can't do that. Can I sell them? No, you would be making money off of giving somebody else the problem. <laughs> no, I think the best thing for you to do is to take a hammer and smash them into pieces and bury them in the ground. Ooh. Why should I do that? Not that you... Not that I think you're going to worship a Buddha or you're going to worship the spirit of Buddha, but the spirit of Buddha will have access to your house and to your family. So I'm not sure exactly what all happened when she went back to China, but, you know, if you're worshiping anything other than the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit of the Bible... You're worshiping an idol. Or if you put anything in a significant way ahead of worshiping Father, Son, and Spirit, you may have an idol in your life. Or a reviler, one who's always just stirring up trouble. Or a drunkard. You just are just can't get away from the bottle. Or an extortioner, that is, one who's blackmailing people to get money all the time, squeezing money or goods out of people. Um, not even to eat with such a person. Don't, don't fellowship with that person if they are active in the church and they claim to be believers and at the same time they're, they're, living, they're living a dual life. Don't fellowship with them, is what Paul said. For what, I, what have I to do with judging those also who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? What's he talking about, inside and outside? He's talking about those who are active, active fellowshipping members of the church and those who are not yet believers, those on the outside. But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves that evil person. And he's actually quoting Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is uh, part of the Pentateuch. It's the fifth book of the Old Testament. And it's basically um, God's instructions to Moses. <clears throat> to give to the children and the grandchildren of all of those who came out of Egypt who did not believe God, they would not go into the promised land, and they wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years until that whole generation passed. The kids and the grandkids were going to go into the promised land. Deuteronomy is God speaking through Moses to get them ready to go in and to continue worshiping the real God. Dare any of you, I'm going to jump into chapter 6, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints. Boy, 
Paul's not pulling any punches here. I think he, um, you know, he talked about you have divided loyalties because you're, you, you, you're following men and not Christ. Then he talked about sexual immorality, and now he's talking about lawsuits. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Who are the saints? The believers, the followers of Christ. We are made holy by Jesus himself. It doesn't mean that we're perfect yet, but it means in our spirit we are holy because the Holy Spirit lives there. And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How about that? Followers of Jesus? will judge angels. How much more things that pertain to this life? If, if you then have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? In other words, you've got, you have ju uh, civil judges in the community who are not followers of Christ, but you've got a lawsuit against a fellow believer in Christ. And so you're taking it before that judge who is not a believer, who is not a follower of Christ, who doesn't necessarily follow the teachings of the Bible. I say this to your shame. Is it so that there's not a wise man among you, not even one, who will be able to judge between his brethren? A brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. Hmm. Now, therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Oh. Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? Wait a minute, Paul. Wait just a minute. That foot of land belongs to me. It doesn't belong to the neighbor. Is he a fellow believer in Christ? Yes. But we're going to file a, we're going to file a lawsuit because he's moved the boundary. Paul says, why don't you just let it go? Aren't you willing to just even be cheated? No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do these things to the brothers. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Paul probably could have listed some other, some other. And what, what does he mean, by the way? Uh, let's just take one of these here. Idolaters. Let's just take that one, for instance. Is it possible to worship an idol and then be convicted that that's wrong? You get rid of your idol and you fall on your face, so to speak, before the one true holy God and worship God and you receive Jesus as your personal Savior and you begin to follow him. Does that mean you don't inherit the kingdom of heaven? No. It just means those who, that's what they do, that's what they do, that's what they do. It's a lifestyle, and they're not going to change. They don't want to follow Jesus. They don't want to trust God. That's what he's talking about. Those will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
and such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. <laughs> wow. We're going to talk about that. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Okay, so is there, is there any hope for folks like that? Yes. As long as you're still alive and breathing, yes, there's hope. It doesn't matter if, if, if you know which one of these, or maybe you've got multiple things going on for you. <clears throat> God will receive you if you honestly come before him, repenting. Admitting you're a sinner, asking forgiveness, and trusting and believing in Jesus as your personal Savior. Yes, he will forgive you and cleanse you. <laughs> it's not like, okay, I'm forgiven, but I've got all this old junk that's still sloshing around in here. No, it's not. He cleanses. He forgives and he cleanses. So, some of you were like this, but you were washed, washed by the blood of Christ. You were sanctified. Sanctified is an English word that comes from um, the Latin word sanctus, which means holy. You were made holy on the inside. So, you were washed by the blood of Christ, you were cleansed. You were made holy on the inside. You were justified. Justified means that if you're standing before holy God, you're accepted. He receives you. The evangelist usually likes to say it means justified never sinned. Just if I'd never sinned. You stand before a holy God. And what does holy God do? Let's just, let's just think for a minute. You are suddenly standing before, before God the Father, holy God. And you have trusted in Jesus as your personal Savior. You followed Jesus as best you, as best you could, as best you understood. How is holy God going to respond to you? Is he going to go, hmm... Let me think about you. I don't know. I'm not sure about you. Um, I mean, I don't know if I need to be warmed up to you and let you into heaven. I, I just don't. Is he going to be like that? No, he's not. How's he going to be? How will he react? How will he respond to you? Does that mean you were perfect when you were living on the earth? No, it doesn't. You were a sinner like all the rest of us. But you were cleansed, you were forgiven, washed clean, made holy on the inside, cleansed so that you, just as if you'd never sinned. And, in that, and by the way, adopted as a child of God. So you're standing before holy God the Father. How is he going to respond to you? I think... He's going to give you a big hug and say, welcome home. That's what I think. How can he do that? Because he sees his only begotten son, Jesus, in you. That's how he can do it. You're his kid. Hey, when our kids come home, we rejoice. Yeah. And there's a lot of kids who need to come home. Yeah. They need to come home to earthly fathers and to earthly mothers. They need to come home to the faith. Don't miss out, please, whatever else happens. Don't miss out on trusting in Jesus. Everything depends on it. Let's pray. 
Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much that you receive us, that you cleanse us. Somehow you have the power to make us holy on the inside when we know we're not, we're not holy, but you make us that way. Thank you that we are received by you. Not because how good we are, because we're not, but because of how good Jesus is. So, Lord, I pray for anybody who may be watching this, that they will open their heart and life to Christ. Even today. Today would be a good day. Pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I want us to be in prayer, church, for Jordan, Maine. I got word this afternoon that he may have had a stroke. I don't know any details beyond that. But I want us to be in prayer for Jordan. And then I need to announce to you that this coming Sunday morning at our 1045 worship service, our choir will be presenting Experiencing God, the musical. It's, it's fantastic music. Our choir is doing a good job with it. And I would invite you to come and just be a part of it. Bring some folks with you. And also, uh, now our church is having AA meetings on Sunday afternoons at five, from 5 to 6 p.m., 5 o'clock. If you struggle with some of those issues, whether it's alcohol or drugs or any kind of addiction, you would be welcome to the meetings. Um, Sunday afternoon at 5 over in our old fellowship hall area. Uh, you, you, you won't miss it. They've got a sign. They would have a sign up there. So, Lord, we're praying for Jordan and for so many of our family and friends who could use a very powerful, special touch of healing from you. We pray you would raise them up, raise them up. We pray for those who are caught up in the web of addiction. We're praying for deliverance. And we pray, Lord, as our choir presents this music Sunday morning, your presence would just fill this place. In Jesus' name, amen. It was a great joy this past Sunday to start off our worship service with baptism. We're going to be baptizing again on November the 10th. A couple of ladies who will be uh, making their confession of their faith in Christ and following Jesus in water baptism. If you've never been baptized since you believed, uh, I would strongly encourage you to consider following Jesus. Okay? God bless you. Our services are open. If you don't have a church, come visit us. 930 Bible City, 1045 Worship on Sunday morning. God bless